Good evening. It is Friday, April 24th, 2020, and it is 6 p.m. in the capital of the United States of America, Washington, D.C., and you are tuned to the Critical Hour here on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, political scientist, author, and nationally syndicated columnist, Dr. Wilmer Leon, and for the next hour, we will explore and analyze the salient news stories that are impacting the global village in which we live. Well, it's Friday, so we'll kick off today's show the way we do every Friday with my first guest. He's a frequent collaborator with all major news outlets and author of City Builders and Vandals in Our Age. He is Caleb Moppin. As always, Caleb, welcome back. Glad to be here, as always. So let me quickly give the update on the spread of the virus throughout the country. There are now 903,000 confirmed cases 83,350 people have recovered, and unfortunately, 51,061 people have died. That is as of today, Friday. After a presentation yesterday that touched on the disinfectants that can kill the novel coronavirus on surfaces and in the air, the president pondered whether Uh, disinfectants could be used to fight the virus inside the human body. Quote, I see the disinfectant that knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that by injection inside or almost a cleaning? Because you see, it gets inside the lungs and it does a tremendous number on the lungs. So it would be interesting to check that. End quote. Folks, I would be laughing about this, but I am concerned that someone will hear that question and think it's okay to drink Lysol or that it's okay to drink bleach or some other type of disinfectant. It is not. Do not. That is ridiculous and dangerous, if not deadly. With that now, Uh, Caleb, Iran launches its first military satellite. Iran's Revolutionary Guard deployed a Ghassid satellite carrier to put the device into space, a previously unheard of system, while amid the COVID-19 failures of his administration, the president threatens acts of war with orders to shoot down Iranian boats. Uh, Your thoughts on this latest action by Iran? Well, this is Iran demonstrating strength uh, because Iran has suffered tremendously amid the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, The sanctions imposed by the United States have made that suffering more intense. And as a result of that, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is really the central element in the the revolutionary government of Iran, that's, that's an element that is accountable only to the supreme leader of Iran, even the elected president uh, does not, they are not accountable to him. Uh, the parliament, uh, it is, they are directly accountable only to the supreme leader. They are the ideological armed force uh, within the Islamic Republic, and they very much represent uh, the hardline uh, revolutionary anti imperialist traditions that come out of the Islamic Revolution, Khomeini, and such. And they are making clear uh, that Iran is continuing to be able to defend itself. And despite the fact that they've suffered horrendously during the pandemic, they are not afraid to fight back. And that the efforts by the United States to essentially weaponize the pandemic have not forced them to the point of surrender. Iran has gotten tremendous support from China. China has dispatched a large number of doctors and medical supplies to Iran to help the Iranian people uh, in this situation. And it appears that the Revolutionary Guards, by sending up a satellite, uh, are making very, very clear to the entire world uh, that they will not uh, they will not be destroyed and that they continue to uh, protect the country. And this strategy of, um, I believe Mike Pompeo used, uh, used, used the term maximum pressure and utilizing maximum pressure during this pandemic, which is really a violation of, of human rights. It's a war crime, essentially, when you prevent people from getting medical aid, civilians from getting medical assistance. Uh, that's a war crime. It's a violation of international law. Uh, these unilateral sanctions imposed on Iran that were escalated during the, the crisis, it really hasn't, it hasn't weakened the Islamic Republic and that the Revolutionary Guards and the military of Iran remain strong and prepared to defend themselves in the case of an attack. The United States alleges that this program is a cover 
for missile development. But if a country is able to successfully launch a satellite into orbit with a two-stage launcher, the delivery mechanism must be fairly developed. I don't know how much cover this is. They're, they, they're hiding this in plain sight. Well, every time Iran tests missiles, um, there's this this anger uh, from Western media. And if you read the articles, you would get the impression that this is like these are missiles that are going to have nuclear weapons on them or something. But the reality is this. Israel has a huge amount of cruise missiles, missiles, military equipment. Israel is Iran's enemy. Iran uh, has its own uh, and has long had a missile system uh, to defend itself so that if Israel were to launch missiles at Iran, Iran would be able to retaliate, um, and that would deter Israeli attack. I mean, think about the Cold War. They talk about strike enabling. Um, you know, if you have a system that can prevent uh, that can prevent any retaliation from your attack, you, are, you then have a strike enabling system, um, and that gives you the ability to carry out a strike and not suffer any retaliation. So Iran is making sure that if Israel were to attack them, they would have the ability to attack back and inflict uh, retaliatory costs on Israel. And they've, they've maintained that missile system for a long time. There's nothing new about it, and there's nothing nuclear about it either. Um, this is not about nuclear weapons. This is about uh, deterring Israeli attack. And, and that's how war is largely fought. I mean, in, since the 1990s, the primary way wars have been waged has been with cruise missiles. Um, you, know, it's, you know, one country launches missiles in another country, not nuclear missiles, just regular, you know, regular combat, uh, destructive missiles. That's been the way that, uh, that these kind of wars are fought. Um, so Iran has a missile system, and there's nothing, nothing – we shouldn't be surprised about it. It's not an, a, a huge scandal that they have it because it's something they're using to deter foreign attack. And the more threat they face, the more unilateral sanctions are imposed on them, the more Israel uh, develops its weapon systems and its Iron Dome to, to you know, make itself strike-enabling, the more we should expect Iran to develop its own weapon systems. I mean, there's nothing, nothing particularly scandalous about it if you understand the context. It all kind of makes sense. But the way U.S. media portrays it, it's kind of this hysteria. Oh, my gosh, Iran tested a missile. We all know they're trying to get a nuclear bomb so they can kill Israel and kill the whole world or something. That's, that's, that's the, the tone U.S. media uses when creating alarmism and talking about Iran. It's not looking at the facts of the situation. And to the point of looking at the facts of the situation, I think it's also incredibly important to remember that Iran is a sovereign nation. And as a sovereign nation, they are well within their rights to do what they're doing. They're not violating any treaties. They're not violating, as far as I've read, they're not violating any international law. In fact, the United States and Israel are threatening them. So they're well within their rights to defend themselves. Sure, and they're fully adhering to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The International Atomic Energy Agency has been in Iran, and they have never violated their requirements under that treaty. Every nuclear power site was inspected. And furthermore, they fully 100 percent complied with the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and even Trump himself was forced to admit that. Uh, Trump said that he felt Iran was not complying with the, quote, spirit of the agreement. But in terms of the actual agreement, not the spirit of it, not the feelings you get from the agreement, not the emotional content, not the touchy-feely, you know, mindset, you know, the vibes of the agreement, but the actual text of the agreement, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations all confirmed Iran was 100 percent in compliance. They took down all the nuclear power sites they were told to take down, even though those nuclear power sites themselves were allowed under the, under the non-proliferation treaty. So. This notion that Iran is trying to get a bomb so it can destroy the whole world, you know, that, that's all over CNN, that's all over MSNBC, that's all over Fox, but it's hype. I mean, it's just not reality. Um, and uh, the more people can get that out of their heads and realize that Iran is a sovereign nation uh, seeking to maintain its government and its political and economic system, uh, the more we can understand the reality of the situation. You know, I'm glad that you brought up the nuclear power system because for those who have forgotten history, it was the United States back in the 50s that introduced nuclear power to Iran under the Atoms for Peace program. Because I think it was General Electric wanted to sell Iran nuclear power plants. So that, to me, is just an added data point for people to remember as we look at really Who's playing who? 
who's creating what is the United States now wants to portray this as though we've been totally hands off. We have nothing really to do with this. But again, General Electric introduced nuclear power into Iran in the 50s. Sure. I mean, and and let's remember now that some interesting revelations have come out about the Trump administration and nuclear power and nuclear weapons uh, and Saudi Arabia. I mean, people can look into the, the details themselves, but uh, I would be far more concerned about the Saudi royal family, uh, you know, that, that right. is spreading terror, terrorism across that region and has ties to Wahhabi extremists. I'd be far more concerned about them having nuclear weapons than I would about the Islamic Republic. Uh, and the Islamic Republic of Iran makes very clear that they have no aspirations for nuclear weapons of any kind. In fact, part of the reason Iran was neutral during the Cold War was they did not want to be aligned with any nuclear power. Uh, the, the Ayatollah has condemned and put a, a, a fatwa on nuclear weapons of all kinds, um, and it is simply not permitted. And it's not even permitted to discuss uh, the, the, uh, the acquiring of nuclear weapons in Iran. Um, and we know that peaceful nuclear scientists... Uh, you know, who are doing nothing but teaching classes on physics and overseeing uh, nuclear power plants were gunned down by the Mossad, uh, you know, and assassinated in the streets of Iran. I mean, I mean, the, the way Iran has been portrayed and treated with regards to its peaceful nuclear energy program should be a huge source of burning outrage to anyone familiar with international law and the situation. The story came out today that Iran commander claims forces were ready to hit 400 U.S. targets in January. Uh, the commander of the uh, Iran Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the air arm, has claimed his troops are ready to attack hundreds of American targets. People need to understand that Donald Trump keeps trying to keeps trying to swat this hornet's nest, and eventually, you don't want to get stung. And th this is just not a good idea, as the president threatens war with the order to shoot down Iranian boats. And I got to tell you, uh, Caleb, the one thing that concerns me about this more than anything is I didn't know Iran had flying boats. Well, I'll tell you this. You know, this is yet another example. I, I fit this in very closely with Trump's, you know, support of these protesters in Michigan and other states. You know, Trump, he, he wants to present himself as if he's this strong, powerful leader who's fearless and does whatever he wants and tells it like it is. But if you really look at the behavior of his administration, he is a coward, right? He has a, a very, very diverse coalition of supporters, right, of different factions, whether it's the Miami folks who fled Cuba, whether it's, you know, Bernie Marcus um, and, and Sheldon Adelson and people tied to the Likud party in Israel, whether it's, you know, some of these libertarian elements and, and he is afraid of offending any of them. And he is desperately trying to please them all. Um, and it, 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 this is the commander in chief. And he can't even tell people to stay indoors and not have big public, public gatherings and protests during a pandemic, right? Because he's afraid of offending them. He's afraid of losing any momentum among his base. He's afraid to pour co cold water on his base. The same reason that in this situation that we're facing a pandemic, he can't even he can't even de-escalate with Iran. He can't even say maybe we should deal with the United States right now. Maybe we should get things under control. But he's so afraid of losing the support of of you know of of certain factions that that he has to please. I mean, it, Trump is very very cowardly. Um, he's he's very scared and he's he's constantly trying to please these constituents uh, that have conflicting agendas. Uh, what they want, what different constituents want, is not always the same. It doesn't always line up. But, but Trump is very much uh, beholden to, to different people within his coalition. That's very apparent if you look at his erratic behavior right now, both internationally and domestically. He said, quote, I have instructed the United States Navy to shoot down and destroy any and all Iranian gunboats if they harass our ships at sea. Again, why you're shooting down boats, I don't know. But the real question to me here is, haven't we seen this film before? It's called The Gulf of Tonkin. Haven't we seen this film before? It's called The Sinking of the Main. And again, if Americans had any uh, understanding of history, I think they would be able to see through the bluster and the bullying and understand that this could be the pretext for another false flag operation. 
Indeed. Um, and it's also, I mean, you have to remember that the oil prices are not doing too good right now. And uh, any tension with a big oil producing country and any tension in that region, uh, you know, might be an effort to just try and get them out of the rock bottom state they're in. Switching gears here, the state of Missouri is trying to sue the country of China over coronavirus economic losses. Earlier this week, Missouri became the first U.S. state to sue the Chinese government over its handling of the coronavirus, saying that China's response to the outbreak that originated in the city of Wuhan brought devastating economic losses to the state. Mississippi is announcing plans to file, but this is just, I think, ridiculous. And it's adding to this anti-China narrative that many in the Trumposphere uh, have been trying to promote. Well, sure. I mean, I'm sorry, but if, I mean, if we're going to say that a country's handling of the coronavirus was inadequate, why don't we look at our own government's handling of, of the coronavirus? I'm sorry, but if you look at it, China, you know, they, they, they scrambled and they, they took care of business. And they're coming back to life economically right now. Their handling of it seems to get things done. And at the time that China was responding to the pandemic, let's not forget that our media accused them of being authoritarian. Oh, my gosh. Look at these draconian rules. People are being forced to stay indoors. Can you believe it? You know, there was nothing but condemnation of their swift effort to resolve the situation. It seems to have worked. Uh, Their situation is improving. In fact, their new cases seem to be coming from other countries at this point, from Brazil and elsewhere. Uh, The new cases that are, you know, coming to China, Uh, they, they are originating from overseas. China has dealt with this very, very swiftly and effectively. Now, uh, people say, well, they took six days. Sure, they took six days to make sure it was really what it was. They didn't want to create mass panic um, as they were trying to determine what was actually going on. But once they determined what was going on, they alerted the world. They worked with the World Health Organization. Um, they brought the hammer down, and they, they built emergency hospitals. They mobilized the public, and they dealt with this. Um, and meanwhile, our government is so disorganized and confused um, that, that, I mean, we're, we're at the point where it's, I mean, they don't even, I mean, the lockdowns aren't even really, you know, totally being enforced. I mean, they're trying in New York city with different ways. Uh, but, uh, but we're in a situation where, I mean, we could be suing our own government for goodness sakes. We should sue Trump for, for praising public gatherings. He's the president of the United States and people are gathering in big groups, you know, with flags and total violation of, of what needs to be happening now for public safety. And he's praising them. Can I sue Trump over that? You know, if I know somebody who gets coronavirus, I mean, this is this is this is totally a misrepresentation. And it's a way to deflect blame. Right. The whole world is watching the United States system, you know, crashing and burning right now. I mean, we cannot handle this. We are we have no ability to handle this. Um, We are simply out of control. Our economy is a mess. I mean, the government doesn't know what it's doing. Every state is doing its own thing. The president can't figure out if we should drink disinfectant or not. Uh, this is this is an embarrassment, and and to just say, oh, China did it, you know, that's easy, right? And that and and let, let's let's remember, China is very culturally different than the United States, different history and such, and so appealing to that jingoism and that you know fear of the other, um, it, it's much safer to blame somebody on the other side of the planet, uh, and it's it's than to admit your own flaws, and I think that that's that's the situation we've got here. You know, I, I, the only thing that, that I take issue with that you just said is that we can't handle this. I think we can. I think it's worse that we're not because of mismanagement. It's not because of inability. When, when the president deconstructs the Office of Pandemic Response, well, then, yeah, you're going to have problems managing a pandemic because you don't have anybody in the Office of Pandemic Response to do so. When the president refuses to employ the the law that, re- that can require the president to have companies build things, there are a number of, of, of elements in place that the president is just refusing to employ that would have gone a very long way in managing this. So I, I and I, we're probably just splitting hairs here, but we could manage it. And I, but I think it's even worse that we're not because of incompetence and, and the fact that the president is inept. Indeed, indeed. I couldn't agree more. Caleb Moppin, as always, man, thank you so much for your time today. Please, please continue to stay healthy 
and always appreciate your contribution. Look forward to having you back. Sure. My best wishes to you and your family. Thank you, man. All right, folks, you're listening to The Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, Dr. Wilmer Leon. There is more on the other side. Stay tuned. 